anytime you're ready. Okay. You ready? Lily, you ready? You ready? Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, I'm back from vacation. Everybody should take a one week vacation to Silva, North Carolina, where it was 70, 85, 78 degrees every day. And I'm back in Houston where it's a lovely 100 and, I don't know, oh, geez. No, it's really beautiful. If you're in Telluride, it's not, no, it's not, it's not. Anyway, back at it, let's talk about what's going on. And lots happened in the last two weeks, actually. Well, I should never go on vacation because look what happens. So, big outbreak in China. Over a dozen cities now are having uh, BA5 outbreaks. Uh, yet, the world is tired of COVID. So, uh, the Norwegian Cruise Line said they're no longer asking pace, uh, passengers to show negative coronavirus tests. Now, that's really smart. I'm going to get on a cruise with thousands of people, and <laughs> what are the odds that somebody will be carrying coronavirus on a 5,000 cruise? Oh, never mind. Uh, but Cyprus is you know, staying intelligent. They've actually reinstated masks. So it's a crazy world out there because some people are just denying that we even have a pandemic, and, you know, and a lot of people are just sick of it. Meanwhile, Japan's having a giant outbreak. So Japan has had more cases than they've ever had, and it's all being driven. Here's a big graph. Look at this. Japan is really on fire. Uh, also in South, uh, South Korea and still Australia. Uh, they had, Japan had over 230,000 cases for the first time. So they are really at the same height as we were for, for a while there. Their fatality rate is very low, um, and the reason for that is mostly because it's being driven by teenagers, young kids and teenagers like you. Uh, and you can see this. This is the adoption of third shots. Uh, Japan is the, in 17 to or 12 to 19 year olds. Japan, very low adoption of booster shots uh, and even vaccination. So they were very good at vaccinating the elderly, not so much young people and teenagers are not getting vaccinated, much less their third shot. So they are really driving the uh, epidemic in um, Japan. United States, case numbers about the same, 130,000, been pretty flat. But we really know that's a giant underestimation because most people are testing at home. Uh, and the, so probably a better indicator is hospitalizations and, and um, wastewater analysis. But hospitalizations continue to increase. So even though case numbers flat, it's probably going up in case number as well because hospitalizations are slowly uh, trickling up. Uh, but the death rate, mortality rate has been pretty constant. We've been uh, pretty steady at around 400, which is much less than it was before. But if you look at the new cases reported by the CDC, it doesn't look like it's going up a lot, but it is going up a little. And if you look at the states on a heat map, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. About half the states are reporting increases and about half the states are reporting decreases. And so you just have to look at your local data. I mean, it's really kind of a... Looks like freckles. The only place it seems kind of low is uh, the Northeast. So if you look at new admissions, though, as I said, it is trickling up. This is CDC data. And you can see admissions to hospitals are going up. So that probably means case numbers going up, even though we're not reporting it because people are testing at home. And most of that uh, hospitalization is being driven by uh, the age group of over 70. And BA5 is the dominant strain. BA5 is now 85%. You can see in the green bar, 85%. This is an interesting uh, CDC report looking at the waves. Uh, remember Omicron BA1, huge spike in January, came down, <laughs> things were good. I was celebrating, that's probably when I got it. Uh, and BA4 and 5 became the dominant strain, BA5 now is this wave. But I think again, we're under reporting. The, the wave is probably a lot higher than that, but it is all BA5. Harris County remains high risk. We have over 270 cases per 100,000 and over almost 20 hospitalizations per 100,000. So remember the CDC has to be under 200 and under 10 hospitalizations to be low risk. And our friends in Dimmit County are keeping up with us. They're high risk, 128 cases per 100,000. So we've gone back to reporting what's going on in the Texas Medical Center. And the good news is if you look at it, hospitalizations were up but are beginning to plateau. So I have a feeling we're probably at the worst of it and it's gonna start getting better. Hopefully over the next two to three weeks, we'll see a decline in case numbers. And similarly, if you look at wastewater, this is our peak. We hit a peak and now it's beginning to come down as well. So 
based on this, two weeks from now, we should begin to see a decline in case number. And hopefully by the start of school, things will be cooled down and people will feel more comfortable sending their kids to school. So two big papers in science about the origin of the virus. Uh, and they're important because the authors of these uh, papers were some of the scientists that signed, the 28 scientists, or 18 scientists that signed a petition that was published in Science saying we should really be suspicious about the virus and do more in-depth analysis of, where, of the origin, you know, and, and give some more validity potentially to the lab leak theory, but at least just to explore more. So several of them are, on, are authors of these two papers in Science. So the first one, uh, uh, Picard et al. from UC San Diego, they, they did deep sequencing trying to figure out when was the first uh, it's, uh, transmission to humans. And ba basically they found, uh, very interestingly enough, that there are probably two jumps into humans, lineage A and lineage B, based on their sequence analysis, that happened right around November 19th. And they thought they were two different entries probably around that same time. And so the window between when the first zoonotic spillover happened and then case reports, which is in December, was very, very narrow. And so what they thought was it most likely was a zoonotic spillover, just like SARS and MERS were, uh, but with two fairly uh, closely related events in November, two different lineages, and then one took off uh, from there. The second paper was by uh, Warabi et al from the University of Arizona, and they really focused on the spatial relationships in the Hunan seafood wholesale market. And that market sold wildlife and farmed animals, both live and butchered, and they identified the very first 155 cases uh, and looked at longitudinal uh, and latitude data for where they were. And what they concluded was that the, pan the pandemic, the early epicenter of the, of the pandemic was likely the Wuhan seafood market. And you know, is this going to prevent people from believing that it began in a Chinese laboratory? <laughs> no. But, you know, it pretty is pretty strong evidence. Uh, you know, these investigators all suggested that the only reasonable explanation for the data is that it started in the Wuhan seafood, mar seafood market, or this wet, lit, wet market. We still don't know which animals were responsible for it. We haven't found the, you know, the animal that actually caused the very first spillover. But it's a lot like HIV. We never found the chimpanzee that, that actually was the, per, you know, was the chimpanzee that transmitted the first HIV into humans. So it's similar to that. But you know, the circumstantial evidence all points to two spillover events that happened in the seafood market. And I just want to spend a little bit of time on that second paper because it's really, really interesting. If you look at, the, they looked at every single case uh, and, they, and they identified through ma spatial mapping it's like a bullseye, right? This is, these are all the cases, big bullseye, and that bullseye is the Hunan seafood wet market. And then they also had pictures of, of animals that were in the market. You can see these animals stacked up here. All kinds of animals stacked together, and they traced in the stalls which one of those, uh, where the index cases were. And they did a catalog of all the animals that were there alive and which ones we know are susceptible to coronavirus infection. And there's like an entire list that were all alive in that market. Raccoon dogs, hedgehogs, hog badgers, Asian badgers, Chinese hares, all of these, been, all these animals are known to be, inf can be infected by uh, SARS-CoV-2. So they had all these animals that were potential sources, it's all points to the market. We already know from uh, Joe Petrosino's group that somewhere along the line, uh, the virus acquired, you know, bat virus acquired a pangolin spike protein, probably transmitted to one of these animals, which is brought into the market, and that is likely uh, how the virus got started in humans. So, you know, it doesn't answer everything, but as I said, I think two years ago, the data strongly suggest that it's a spillover zoonosis. Okay, I have had a ton of questions while I was gone on vacation about monkeypox. So let's have a discussion about monkeypox. So, you know, it is endemic to West Africa, these little blue circles. That is, that is fairly common. There's always about a thousand cases. The monkeypox strain in, in, that is endemic in West Africa is much more virulent, and there are usually, you know, hundreds of deaths as a result. The, the monkeypox that is uh, in Europe and the U.S., 
is not as virulent. And you can see the largest number of cases in Europe are in Spain. And the, the, the largest number of cases now are in the U.S., with over 5,800 cases in the U.S. and 4,000 or so in Spain and 2,500 in, in England. So how did this all begin? Well, it's likely that uh, it leapt from Europe and North America through two mass rave parties. Now you have to go back and well, be, be, think back in the old days what a rave party is. <laughs> Bunch of people all clustered together, jumping to music, dancing to music, usually partially clothed. So a lot of skin to skin contact. And there were two giant parties, rave parties in Belgium and Spain that uh, you can trace most of the contacts back to that. And in the US, we now have, I said, over, it's actually 5,800 cases recently reported by CDC. Largest number in New York, 1,390, 827 in California, 442 in Florida. 520 in Illinois and 397 in Texas. So there was a recent paper in New England Journal looked at the largest number of cases to date, 528 recent infections in 16 countries, 98% were in gay or bisexual men. 95% uh, were linked to sexual contact. So, you know, if you look at who's at risk, it's men who have sex with men uh, and people who have contact with those folks and clinicians who take care of patients. So th those are the people who probably should be thinking about getting vaccinated. That risk group should be thinking about getting a monkeypox vaccine. Now, you recall we talked about this a few weeks ago, or a month ago or so. Smallpox was essentially eradicated in 1980 and the WHO declared it as so in, I think, 80, 81. We stopped vaccinating people in 1982. So if you're 40 years or older, you likely got a smallpox vaccine, which is effective against monkeypox. If you're 40 years or younger, you may not, you probably didn't get the vaccine, and so you would be one that would, a person who would be eligible, but you have to be in that high risk group. Men who have sex with men or contacts or healthcare workers. So if you're not in that group, don't write me about what, should you get a vaccine. I mean, I'm sitting there, you know, with my family on vacation. Should I get a monkeypox vaccine? Are you kidding me? <laughs> have fun, go to the beach, enjoy yourself. But you don't, don't go to a rave party. <laughs> That's what I told Lily, no rape parties. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, we have another Alaska Award winner. You think it's only Steve Elledge and Dr. DeBakey? No. Congratulations to Baylor medical student Kaylin Cummins. She was one of six national winners of the ninth annual Alaska Foundation Essay Contest, recognizing the next generation of science communicators. Her essay was about experiences combining medical studies and astrophysics for a broader perspective. Now, I have no. <laughs> I got to talk to her because I have no idea how you combine those two. Although we have space medicine and one of our professors of space medicine is an astrophysicist. She probably took that course. Uh, the other thing is the American Society of Human Genetics gave David Nelson, a professor of molecular and human genetics, the Victor McCusick Leadership Award that recognized that individuals exhibited exemplary leadership and vision in advancing the society's mission. So congratulations to David Nelson. And of course, Lily had her own shout out. American Heart Association released a survey. They found 95% of pet parents rely on their pet for stress relief. I have, I have no idea why that is, if that's the case. So Glenn Levine, professor of medicine at Baylor and chief of cardiology section at the DeBakey VA, was the lead author. The American Heart Association's scientific statement on pet ownership and cardiovascular risk. The bottom line is having a pet may help you reduce your stress, get more fit, lower blood pressure, and be happy. I can't imagine. I believe actually Lily sent that in to him. Anyway, congratulations. So I'm glad to be back from vacation. It's good to see everybody. I can't wait to see you next week.